All right. Well, my featured guest today is a familiar, reassuring, and trusted face for those who are regularly watching Persian media. He is an Iranian-British news anchor, a producer, and a presenter at Manoto TV. Farshad Motaki was born and raised in Rasht. He moved to Tehran at the age of 17 and pursued a degree in business management. At around 23 years of age, he relocated to England and ended up working at an Iranian newspaper called Nimruz for nine years. Since 2015, Farshad, as you may know, has been a prominent figure at Manoto TV, known for his presence as an anchor and an interviewer on such programs such as Otag Khabar and Reportage. And right now, Farshad Motari joins me from London, England. Hello, sir. Hi, Jianjian. How are you today? I'm fantastic. I'm, I'm very happy to have you on the program. Thank you for doing this. Thanks for having me. I'm a fan. Uh, you know, I when when approaching this interview and preparing for it, a couple of people asked me if you can speak English, <laughs> how your English is. And it occurred to me that it must be curious for you that you've been out of Iran for three decades and in the UK. But someone might ask, based on knowing you as a Persian anchor, whether you speak English, does that make you chuckle? Uh, to be honest with you, even for myself, it's uh, sometimes it's hard to speak English because I've been working for um, Iranian media almost for two decades so it's mainly I'm speaking Farsi and also you know it's just like all the friends family so it's mainly speaking Farsi so it made it kind of difficult when he said it's going to be in English I thought I'm a, it's my first actually English interview so it's a challenge I am honored. Uh, and as you've already made evident, your English is immaculate, uh, as it as it ought to be, uh, given how long you've been outside of Iran. But but it is curious that you've spent more of your life outside of Iran than inside. And yet I know that you profoundly identify as Iranian first. Yes, definitely. Definitely. I'm, I'm being born and bred in Iran and I moved to England when I was 23. So basically, a part of me still is in Iran, even though right now I can't go back to Iran. But, you know, I'm I'm really Iranian. I consider myself definitely. Fashad, you're also seen as a very uh, serious guy. I, I, I mean, <laughs> based on the impression you can give as a news reporter and as an anchor, um, you've privately sworn to me that you're not that serious. Do you do you do you find that being on TV is about giving an impression that is sometimes incongruent with reality. In other words, when an Iranian meets you, surely, and recognizes you, do they have an impression of you that surprises you sometimes? Uh, well, to be honest with you, um, in terms of being serious, uh, because we're in news department, so when you're telling the news, it's not a joke. So you got to just your face expression, your body language, everything has to be right. But as a person myself, to be honest with you, people see me and they get surprised. They think, oh, you got a sense of humor. I said, well, I'm a human, you know, so I'm, I can be funny as well. But uh, recently we had a guest from Iran and they came to our house for a dinner. And then after the um, night was over, the gentleman told me, uh, oh, my God, you're very funny. We thought you were, like, re you were really miserable because you're always so serious. I thought, no, I'm not miserable. It's just part of the job, you know. So it depends what you're delivering to people you know let, let me turn it around perhaps and ask you about seriousness and before we get into your personal story and your career you know i was watching you uh in the last few days and thinking about the situation of the world which is a a dire one a particularly heartbreaking one when it comes to israel and gaza right now um not that iranians are immune to tragedy and atrocities of course especially even in the last year but fasha does it take a different level of emotional strength to be anchoring during these times for you? Or is it, and I don't say this in a trite way, but is it another day at the office to a certain extent? Do you have to prepare yourself uh, going in when you know you're talking about lives being lost in the way they are right now in the conflict in the Middle East? 100%. I think it's one of the toughest jobs when you got days like these, which is very hard, you know, and um, emotion will kick in. So it's like... Um, Today, for example, for instance, well, we we've seen few uh, several um, videos from the scene that I can't even describe, and that was it made us all tearful, you know. And that was just before we go for the live show, 
and uh, you think, oh my God, I've got to deliver this. I have to read this script. And that is one of my nightmares when we uh, have things like this comes up and you think um, millions of people are watching you and they count on you. So you've got to, as a presenter, you've got to have that skill to hold on to it. But many times happened to me, maybe four or five times that I break into tears in front of the yes. camera in the live program. And, you know, so no emotion kicks in and it's very difficult for me to control it. How do you, um, I actually love the fact that you've, you've been emotional at times on TV. It, it's part of the humanity that I think you bring to your, your broadcasting, but, but how do you then prepare for a day like today? Surely this morning when you're going into, to, to know that it's going to, you, you know, it's going to be a tough day. What do you, is there a way you prepare yourself? Um, yeah, you try not to go too deep into the story because uh, end of the day, we're just presenting the thing, but you try not to affect you as much. And you try uh, sometimes even my colleague next to me reading the news, I try to just mime a song in my head and try to just, oh, we play the VT in between our things. We go and watch like three minutes report and we come back. And if it's a, usually it's a sad news recently, I mean, for the last 12 months, I would say all the, all the news is really about Iran, about the Zans and the girls and everything. It was too many sad VTs we had to go through. And I told the producer, please, can you close the voice on the floor so I can't hear it? Because once I hear it, then I won't be able to control it. I mean, all of us, we're the same. And uh, that's that's one of the things, you know, we, we just request not to listen. And I got a col colleague, which is she's fantastic, and she was been working on all the people been injured and killed since last year in the revolution in Iran was happening. And uh, she comes and tells me, uh, Fasha, did you watch my VT? I said, well, do you expect me to watch it and go and cry? So I'm going to watch it when I go home. So it's like, it's become kind of a, we do like a, we try to make it not a joke, but it's like, try to put blind eyes and not to watch it while you're actually presenting the news. It's very hard. But, but it's amazing. I mean, I know that, you've done a lot of things in your life, but you, you have been an anchor for eight years. You've been doing a bunch of different shows at Manitou. You've also been a reporter in the field. You've done that reportage show where you're, where you're going sometimes to conflict, conflict areas. Um, it, it's interesting. It's interesting. I mean, maybe, maybe it's, um, maybe, I, maybe it's somewhat heartening that you are not um, somehow that hasn't, uh, drained the 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 emotion out of you to having seen all that you've seen, having done that you've all that you've done day in day out. You're still emotional. You're still uh, those tears are still close for you, huh? Yeah, I think it's your personality. I know people that they can deliver any news without even robot face, like really poker face, and they can do it. I can't do it uh, personally. I'm a very sensitive person. If I see a kids got disability or anything in the streets. It happens before to me. We walk into the supermarket with my wife. I see like a two years old in a pram, disabled. And I pull my wife's hands and come out and I start crying. I hug her and start crying. She says, what happened? Tell me what happened. I said, you see that kid? She said, oh, please don't look because you can't. It's, it's me. You know what I mean? So, but some people can take it. They don't just go over it without even get affected. But for me, it's very difficult. I'm a very emotional person. And how deliver... do how do how do viewers react when you're emotional? Like those times when you've cried, what's the reaction you've received? Um, the the first time that happened, the it was for me, it was something new as well. It was my first time actually reporting about a five years old. It was uh, I reported Gozar Shkar. I was doing end of the show, and it was a five years old boy in Khiabuna Valley, in Tehran. And he was actually selling like um, things. And it was nine, nine o'clock in the evening. The eye reporter was filming. It was a young lady. And she said, oh, he's only like five years old. And the, it's like minus one degree in Tehran. And he's just working for this. And I'm getting this for the Gozarish Karamanoto. So I edited the things and everything. And I thought I'm going to be okay. So, so what? And we see this a lot. And then once I was presenting, I burst into it. I couldn't finish my sentence. Hmm. And once we went to the VT to watch the actual video, because I give a little link, then we watched the uh, report is being sent to us. And uh, everybody came and hugged me and said, you've got only 50 seconds, finish it off because you have to pick it up again. And I've done it. But next day, 
I mean, when they put on the social media in Manitou, it, it was a big impact. I was thinking people would say how unprofessional this presenter is that he couldn't hold his emotion, but it was exactly other way around. People loved it. They said, we are so glad to see somebody is not just a robot or poker face standing there and telling us things. So you take that to your heart, you feel what's happening there, and it's, that is, is, is uh, touch people's heart. And I thought, uh, that gave me actually a reputation that, you know, I'm a human as well. I'm not just a TV presenter that has got no emotion. Yes. You've also not been, uh, I mean, you've not been shy about your opinions at times, at least not, if not on the air, in, in, in your social media, in your, you know, your sort of public face outside of the being on TV. And, and you've, I mean, you've, you've made no, no bones about the fact that you're not a fan of the current regime in Iran and, and you this week have, have been quite outspoken about your, your support for Israel, or at least your sorrow at the loss of Israeli lives this week. Um, it's not something that we always see news anchors do or say in social media. There's that postulate of objectivity where they're they're not supposed to show um, any sort of opinion on on any kind of side. What kind of rules do you have around this, uh, either personally or with Manotou? Well, with Manotou, basically, because we are not a commentator, we we are not politicians, so we just tell the news without taking anybody's side. We just tell the news what is happening. So that is our duty and we deliver that. But when it comes to my personal page in Instagram or Twitter or Facebook or whatever, I think I've got a duty as a human to shout out and let people know because I don't support any country. I can't say I'm a pro-Israeli or pro-Palestinian. I think I'm about humanity. So if I see somebody's being bullied, doesn't matter is a person is a country or is a group so i think if i can do something if i can be the voice i will be that okay uh, maybe i don't have a big amount of followers on my social media but the people who are following me they believe me and they respect me and i share my opinion with them and that might change some people's vision as well do you know what i mean so so nobody nobody upbraids you or or or, or to calls you in the office and says, "Hey, settle down. Don't don't take any sides. Don't say anything in, in your Instagram. Uh, you know we're supposed to be objective here. You don't get any of that from the network." No, no, because it's my personal page, and uh, I know Manoto follows me. But uh, end of the day, no. Even even for the Manoto shows, I mean, nobody tells you what you're putting up or come and check to what you're writing. So because they trust you, they they know you know your job. So it's not like second person going to come and check it. So it's like you go, you deliver what you have to deliver and everyone's happy. If something goes wrong, they will call you in, obviously, but usually it doesn't. Um, and what about the, the, do you, do you get pushback from followers? I mean, surely there's, there's, if somebody's a, I don't know, um, a, a huge supporter of uh, uh, the Palestinian cause and they see you showing your sorrow for Israel and they say, hey, you're a news anchor, you shouldn't be taking a position. Do you, do you get that kind of stuff? To be honest, no, I get like direct, sometimes not a lot, but I get direct message from people that they will tell their opinions. So, no, you are wrong, this is that. Uh, it's, it's not like why you are a news anchor, why are you giving your opinion? But they would just disagree or agree or whatever. But no, not really. People, I don't think people really care much if I'm a news anchor or whatever. But really, that's amazing. That, and 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 even yourself, like before you post something like that, you don't think about it and go, uh, "What if this pisses off some people? What if I'm?" Uh, I mean, it's 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 quite from the heart, I guess. You're just you just put out what you feel. Uh, yes. Do you know something? I think uh, I should have that freedom when it's my free time and it's my own page, it's my private page. So I should be have that freedom of speech so I could say what I think. When it comes to Iranian, I it's, they, they're my, you know, have that time. So I have a duty. So I have to shout out. I, I will feel myself. I'm in Iran. So they don't have no voice. Nobody can hear them or as much so i got a duty to do that and I, I won't hesitate right right but i guess somebody at at uh i i, I don't know I was, I was gonna say bbc persian but let's say some some place would say if if an anchor says this you know um i hate what khamenei is doing then somebody can turn around and say well when this guy does the news he's biased because we already know he's against khamenei right 
well, because if you watch the news, which we deliver in, you will see that we are not taking part. So we're just telling the news. That's my job aside. But then I come home, something. Gotcha. You know, see, and I cannot control my, I sometimes I get so frustrated, I get so angry. And then I just put a story or the post and no, no, nobody will in, at Manoto, nobody will tell you. Well, I mean, it's my, it's my private page. I think nobody would disagree with you. It's at least on the the last opinion I cited at Metator at any other uh, Persian network, perhaps. Uh, tell me about um, your kid from Rasht. Uh, would Farshad, as a kid, a little kid growing up in Rasht, would anyone imagine you're going to become a famous TV news star? And no, I don't think so. To be honest with you, when I was little, um, I mean, when I started going to school and then I started secondary school. Um, when I start the year with Avali like, Rahnamayi, then um, teachers come speak to you, and they always used to ask me after that to because when the teacher comes into class, new chapter, they would ask one of the students to read the book with that chapter. So I was the only one. They would always say, I don't know, it was my tone of my voice or something, but they always liked it. So I had that in secondary school and in high school. So and uh, but I never thought about it that maybe one day that would be useful for me. But no, I was never thinking about that, you know. And you, it's what did you think? What did you think? I mean, I know you, as a teenager, you moved to Tehran. In your mind's eye, what were you going to do in your life? To be honest with you, at the time, because uh, there was a war going on between Iran and Iraq, because I was 10 years old when the revolution happened. So it was all this plava happening. You, know, you see this, and it was too much for a 10 years old. I could remember the tear gas. I could see the people of uh, chanting outside you know it was like too much going on then after that the war happened and then we go to the high school and stuff and you're thinking oh my god what's going to happen to me i have to go to um do my duty as well because you have to do your national service for two years in iran and i see like my brother was five years older than me and two of his friends been you know killed in a war and they were i saw the pictures uh, accidentally which they were torn to pieces and it was it was really the things I saw and I thought, okay, that could be me. So you're always worried about tomorrow, what's going to happen. Then we had like air strike from Iraq, Mushak Baran, this and that. So you've always been worried about your life. So we were not thinking about what am I going to do next year? What's my plan for future? Am I going to be a successful person? There was no time to think about this stuff. You were just thinking, to, am I going to survive tomorrow? Am I going to be alive? So, so, it, so we wouldn't count on tomorrow, to be honest with you. Can I actually let me just roll back for a second to something you you were just saying about being ten years old at the revolution time uh, that that is the Islamic revolution uh, the 79, 78, 79. Uh, I'm always actually it's it's a little personal fascination I have with uh, Generation Xers and the Iranian Revolution in terms of at least Iranian Gen Xers because if you think about it when you're I mean if you're if you're two years old during the revolution you don't know what's going on you know and you, you later on you find out and you process how you want you wish to um as something that happened in history and if you're 20 years old or 25 years old you've already sort of developed some sense of self and consciousness and ideology and political wit or whatever of course that can change many people supported the revolution and then realized uh oh we made a mistake 10 years or 20 years or 30 years later but but you have that sense of it when you're 10 you're old enough to know what's going on. In other words, you see that there's people with guns in the streets. There's there's um, mobs. There's anger. There's the Shah is no longer there. You, but you're a little too young to really know what's going on. What was the revolution like for Fashad Motaki? It was scary because, um, to be honest, you hear the gunshot, you hear people out there, the fire smell of the smoke they're burning tires that's what i remember i remember one day um we the street we live in near to golsar which is a famous area and uh, i saw all the i went to buy bread or something i don't remember but and then i saw all these soldiers standing up with the it was a winter so they were wearing all these long coats with the jesse the gun in their hand and then people came and put like a little flower on top of the things and they were just standing there so that stuck in my mind i always remember that but i've never seen actually people killing each other okay even my brother almost got shot in he was only 15 he was a little kid but he was out there i was 10 
But um, it was scary too. I didn't want to go out, to be honest with you. Did you think something bad was happening at the time? What was the feeling? Was it? Uh, I I had no sense of anything those days because I would understand. But I remember my dad would, a um, couple of times I saw him crying. And then when he was listening to the news and then my uncle would tell him, look, what's wrong, what's, up? You know, what's, what's wrong with you? He said, people are making a big mistake because what they're doing, if Shahs leave, we don't know what our future is going to be. So he was pro Shah and he was, I saw his tear coming down, crying. And uh, to me, so that was something that I thought, you know, so probably he's a good person, but why they getting rid of him? But I wouldn't think too much because I was too young. So, but it, it was uh, that sense of a fear. And at the same time, you're a kid, you don't understand. So, yeah, you end up, you, you served in the Iran-Iraq war, right? I did. Yes. What was that like for you? Um, again, scary because when I start uh, my army, it was, uh, Iranian year was uh, 66 and I finished 68. That's the Iranian year. Hazar Sisar Shasto, she started and finished Shasto Hashd. And that was, the first year was end of the war and the second year it was the peace was made. Right. Uh, so I was actually, I did my seven months of my duty in Ahvaz. And when um, a Mersad operation happened, which Mojahedin attacked Iran, uh, they called us to be ready to go for the front line and stuff like this. And it was it was it was very scary to be honest with you. You feel the bitterness in your mouth, all the fear you have, and you're thinking, I see you see your friends got killed the day before in a front line, and you think, oh my God, I'm going to be next. So it, it was full of stress to be honest with you. And I could never imagine that's going to be over. I was thought, I'm going to die. I'm not I'm, I'm not going to finish my army here. It's it's going to be end of you. So it's, in, it's 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 pretty. I'm sorry. I was just gonna say it's pretty normalized for Iranians who grew up in Iran because you know Sarbazi is something that you do. You know you're asked to do. You're you're you're, you're conscripted to do. But for those of us who grew up outside of Iran um, or left Iran as little kids or something, it's um it, it's it's a, a really crazy for. I mean, I can't imagine in Canada. You know, conscription would be. You know, it's not something that's it's very foreign to us. You know, did it? Does it? In your case, did it change you somehow? Uh, it's hard to say. I think so many um, reaction you do now, it comes back from there. I'm quite short temper. And sometimes my wife tells me when you drive, you have a bit of a road. It's, just, it's not because I'm a very kind person. But sometimes I just, for a second, I lose my focus. You know, it's just like, and I'm thinking this comes back from all that stress and the nervousness we have to go through, all that fears. So sometimes uh, you try to control it, but I think some of the um, weakness you have now, I have, maybe comes from those times. But I can't pinpoint say, no, because of that, I've been like this. So it's, but it was a very tough time. It was a very tough time. As Do you have shell shock? I mean, I have a cousin who's exactly your age, who, who when he hears a loud noise, a bang, he'll turn, you know, he, he, it reminds him of, of the wartime, you know, in Iran. Yes. I, listen, if I'm sleeping at night, if somebody buzzed the door, I would just jump like a James Bond. I would hit here and there. I would just, my wife said, what's wrong with you? It was just a door. But I said, no, somebody's there. So okay, you're going to open the door. If my phone rings, I would jump, look left and right. I would be like very, my reaction is very, it's just like, I think I'm worried about something. Do you know, that happens to me all the time. Any any loud noise, I would jump. So in your in your early 20s, you leave to go to England. And I, I love the story of you going to England. <laughs> um, because some guys leave. Uh, some people leave because they are deeply unhappy with Iran. Some leave because they don't think they have the opportunities in Iran. Some are encouraged by their families to go study. Um, some because they have a job in another country. Some leave as refugees. Uh, you left because you loved a girl, right? <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. The story is that, uh, yeah, I was. Uh, we were a girlfriend, boyfriend for like three years. And uh, my wife's half half Iranian, half British. So she used to come and go. Her mom's was in England, dad's in Iran. So summer in England, school time go back. But she came to Iran when she was 12. So she has to go like an international school to learn the Farsi and stuff. Then it was like a distance relative. So we where did come... you meet her? Where did you meet her? Okay. Uh, 
like we are relative, like really far distance relative. And they came to our house one day uh, and we were living in Rash, they were in Tehran. Her dad was a, a admiral. He was a, a Nakhoda capital, I mean, uh, captain for the uh, uh, Iranian Navy. He was a naval officer. And um, so they, they came from Tehran to visit us. And uh, so we become like friends. And that time I was, I think I was 16, 17, maybe. It, yeah, I was about 17 and she was about 13, 14. So I tried to imp Im impress her, you know, so it was I did anything I could do. But yeah, it, it built it up. After a few years, we got married and uh, that's how I came to England. And But there is another story about this. Wait because a second, you, you got married in Iran, right? Yes, I got married in Iran. And, th and then she says, I want to go to England and... and no, it wasn't the case. But my father-in-law said, okay, so now you got married. You can take advantage because she's got a British passport. You go to England. I said, no, no, I'm not going to England. That that wasn't the case because I love Iran. I got my friends, my family. I'm a Shaytun, you know, got my friends, my family. I know the way I speak the language. I go to England. I don't speak English. You know, it's difficult for me. So I would rather not. He said, listen, you're not going to lose anything. Go for three months. I said, but I'm not interested. So it was like... They push and pull, they, they manage it. He said, oh, just go for three months. If you're not happy, you come back. I came to England. I hated it instantly because it wasn't something I was expecting. And I was keep mourning and groaning. I want to go back. But, you know, so we stayed after a couple of years. I got used to it. And um, now I love it, obviously. But but Iran is part of me. It's part of Farshad. So uh, when you speak, I mean, I see Iranian streets. I respect them so much. I put my time for them, speak to them. And it, it's like world to me. You know what I mean? But that's amazing that, I mean, you're saying basically you had, was, were it not for your wife, you would not have, you would have stayed in Iran. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. I mean, the, the eighties and nineties, Iran is not a, a pleasant place and, and you, but you land in England and you don't like it. What, what didn't you like about it? Uh, to be honest with you, it was uh, because I, we're not used to the culture. I couldn't speak the language. I didn't know the roads, you know, everything. The food was like everything. The weather, gloomy, drizzling every day, raining. So it was like, oh, Tehran was like 40 degree, 35 degree here. We're getting like 15 degree for the summer day. I thought, what is this? You can't go to the seaside. You have a sea, but you can't go to the seaside. All the buildings, like all them boring. And I'm thinking, what am I in the narrow roads, traffic, one car have to stop for the other one to come. I said, Tehran was great, you know. Yeah. So, and all the crowds you have, you know, it's fun, parties, this and that. But it was like completely different lifestyle, completely different world. A stunning indictment of London. But you know, I was born in London. It's my home uh, country. <laughs> Yes, you've done a, quite a hatchet job on it now, poor England. But I know you like it now. You, I you, love it. No, no, I love it now. But still, Iran is my country. I, I can never change that with any other country. But, but what I love about the story too is that um, it continues. I mean, you, you, you and your wife are still together, right? It's been over thirty years. You guys are together. Yeah, um, we've been married for. Sorry. Go. You go ahead. Yeah, we've been married for thirty years, and we were friends for three, four years before that. So we are together almost thirty-four years. And and what is the secret of you guys, uh, your your longevity together? Uh, I think she's too nice. Maybe I will give the credit to her because she's not honestly. She's she's the nicest person I've met in my life. Well, appa she's... apparently she can handle your road rage. So that's <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a road rage. No, don't get me wrong. It's like I'm a bit of a bad temper when I'm driving. And if I have a long day, don't, but don't forget, Gian, I have to drive to work for an hour and a half. And then come back hour at so I'm being like on the narrow street where there's no seaside you can visit exactly. at 50 degrees. No yeah. sun shining, so <laughs> um, she she she's a nice person. I think that's a very modest answer. You you I think it takes for 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 people to move to the other side of the world. You've you've changed occupations a few times. I mean, you guys uh, you you must have a tremendous partnership. Yes, we do. We do. We we got very strong bond, and we understand each other. You always have up, ups and downs in your life. You know, there's nothing is going to be like smooth. Uh, Thirty years is not a joke. Thirty four years, but uh, no, we love each other. We respect each other, and we hear each other. Do you know what I mean? That's most important to listen to your partner, see what they need is. You know, uh, your your entree, as I understand it, into media into journalism into into you know uh, uh the kind of work that you do now was working for this newspaper called Nimruz um and you got that gig 
because you had a good facility for typing. Why is it that you were so good at typing? Okay, again, it's a long story because when, uh, as I said, we were in Iran, we were always thinking of tomorrow, how am I going to survive? So my mom came one day before I go to my do my national service, my duty. She said, you know, this next door neighbors, he was a dentist we had in Rash. And he said his nephew, when he was going to the do his duty, he went and learned typing. So I'm going to send you to learn. And I was like, I was 17 years old. I said, no, 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 don't even think about it. I'm not going to go learn typing. Typing is for ladies. I'm not going to do that. She said, no, no, listen, it's going to be just like about two weeks course you do. I'll pay for it. So she forced me into that. And uh, I learned that. And that actually helped me because when I went to do my army, that was part of my job, doing the admin work and doing the typing. It made me very fast typist. And when I came to England, that's how I find the journalism work because that newspaper needed a typist. So I started with that and I carry on. So I stayed at almost 10 years in Nimbrus and ending up with page layout, um, editing, things like this. And it put me in that direction. Then they actually started a um, satellite TV mm. and uh, nominated me as a, t a news anchor. And I was, yeah, they they done a test, camera test, and they thought you're fantastic. You got a good voice. So we're going to use you as a news reader. And I thought, oh, yes, good. But come close to the date, I spoke to my mom. I said, I'm going to start this. And then she said, is this TV is like a politically? I said, yeah. Is the, is the, she said, no, you're not doing that because I want you to come and go. And if you start it, then you can't come back. So I went back next day and uh, I told the, the editor-in-chief, I told her, look, I changed my mind. I kind of, she said, what are you talking about? We, next week we're starting the show. We can't it on you. I said, well, my mom said, no, I can't come. And uh, then we had... Khanume Fakhri Nikzad, we lost her last year, she passed away. Mm -hmm. And she was one of the most famous uh, Iranian radio and TV presenter in Iran. Uh, I'm sure all people know in Iran. And they employed her to come and do the news. But I had my camera test and everything, but I said, no, I'm not going to do it. So that was actually beginning of the things which I got involved. But then, yeah, there's more story about it. How do you feel about that in retrospect? I mean, do you wish you had taken that job then, or is it almost better no, that you it was, didn't it was actually it was good that I didn't take the job because after two months that because of the financial issue they had, they had to shut down so they couldn't maintain. So if I was going that TV for only two months, then I would lose the opportunity because I had a British passport, go and come to Iran. I had no problem. Even though I wouldn't go every year, maybe every four or five years, I would go to Iran to see the family, or the family would come to you to see us. But yeah, I was happy that I didn't take that. By the way, is, is your dear mom still around? She passed away last oh. year. Um, oh, actually, this year, this March. Oh. And uh, yeah, and actually, my sister sent me a video like a couple of years ago because um, just a few years before she passed away, she's had um, Alzheimer's. Yes. And uh, she would recognize me. And so I had a clip of her, which once she passed away, I put it on my social media and it was it went viral. So everybody was saying, you know, Tasliat and everything. And uh, that she's sitting down in front of the TV, watching me reading the news and she's talking to me, smiling, thinking because she couldn't think straight. She think I'm there. And then she turns back to my sister and saying, Rashti, he just ignored me. He's not responding. Why is he like this? You know, and when I put that, when I saw that, I couldn't stop crying for like a couple of days. And that was a couple of years before she passed away. But yeah, I put that on my social media and it was, a, I, I wanted people to see the things we have to bear because we are just the news. Yeah, it's, a, it's I've seen it on your Instagram and it's a, it's a, it's a very powerful and heartbreaking uh, clip, actually. And it's beautiful that you put it up. But it occurs to me that she had a tremendous impact on you. I mean, even in this conversation alone, <laughs> your, your mother's influence is, is throughout, you know, from you being a typist to uh, don't take this job. I mean, sounds like you really listened to her throughout the years. Of course. Of course. I mean, still, I, I walk around in the house. I say things in Rashti, which she would say, uh, because when she would speak Farsi, she had the Rashti accent. And then... Me and my sister always laugh and just giggle and stuff. So I, my wife said, now you talk about your mom more than when she was alive. And I said, look, this is how I will remember her always, the things which she was nice about her and everything. And I cannot, she's part of me, you know, I'm, I'm part of her. So it's it's very hard to, for, you know, forget that. You know, I'm not entirely sure I know what the Rashti accent is. Can you do something in a, say something in Persian in, te, in a Tehran accent, then do the Rashti version? 
Um, you mean, do you want me to speak Rashti or do you want me yeah, to Yeah, I want to hear. Oh, is Rashti not Farsi? Well, it is. Yeah, of course. Yeah, it's just a dialect, right? I, I, I want to hear it. Yeah, it's, wanna... it's, it's a Gilaki. Um, I get to have me saying what is Rashti? What's the uh, الان حرف سندری می ولی چیزی که خاصیم بگم اینه که میدیل خیلی می مارل سنگا بوده خیلی 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 آسان نیه وقتی که این فرد رشته نیه با خیلی صحبت بکنی رشته خیلی سخته حالا شما اگه رشته ببینیشی میام راحت نیست صحبت بکنی ولی الان نه It's سخته. like you keep your mouth it's it's not as you don't open your mouth as much or something yeah, even I haven't spoken rashly for such a quite a long time but doesn't have any key like around me so it's kind of hard maybe uh, that I'm was not... fantastic i enjoyed it um uh tell tell me um now you go and you end up working for a telecommunications company you end up doing a few things and then the big shift that happens in your life that would affect most people who have come to know you through mana toys is this moment eight years ago where you um start working at mana toy and, and and it's curious to me because I'm going to ask you this question at the end about what people have always told you in terms of their expectations of what you could do in life. But, but, you know, to look at you, um, if I were to, and in fact, I mean, I think the first times I, I saw you on Manitou, I would just assume you've been doing that for decades. Like you are that you, you're an anchor who knew at the age of eight, he was going to be an anchor and just started, you know, went in that direction. Um, and because you just, it's so comfortable in you. It's, it's actually quite remarkable to me that formally, like in terms of this being your profession, it's been less than a decade. Um, and in 2015, you really didn't have that much experience when you're thrown into one of the major Iranian TV networks to be a news anchor. How did you, I know your your wife encouraged you to respond to an ad or something, but how did you have the confidence to know that you could jump into that role? Okay, um, it wasn't too difficult for me because I'm a very sociable person, okay? And uh, to me, working in that telecommunication company for almost 11 years, uh, because I had to do lots of meeting, seeing people, facing customers on the phone or whatever, and that's actually built my confidence to a level that I could speak in front of 100 people without being shy. So I know it's some people make it uncomfortable and I think it's it's in you. It's not something that uh, you want to copy or you want to pretend. So I'm kind of, it's, it's my character. If we have a guest, I think I took it after my dad maybe because he was very uh, kind of the same, you know? So it's like... Um, I'm I'm a I'm a very talkative person, so I think uh, I'm not sure if I was confident enough, but um, uh, I'm very comfortable person. I'm, I'm a people's person. I I could put you this way. I'm a people's person. I love talking to people and hang out and socializing. That's that's clear. That's clear actually. From uh, more more so when I see you in the field. But but did you well, for I, did you audition? Did you have to do an audition? Yes, yes. I, um, I, we had to do um, camera test and uh, also interview. And the audition was, yeah, just uh, remembering a page of like they gave me an English um, article. They said you had a few minutes to read this, memorize, and then come and talk about it in front of camera in Farsi. So I thought, mm. oh my God, so how much? It's got five minutes. So. I done it and they apparently was happy with it. And then they came back to me for the interview and they said, we think you're going to be great for the uh, news uh, reporting. So that's how it started. And did you think that you were, when you went and auditioned, is that what you expected that you were going to go straight into news? Or did you think, I mean, Manitou does a lot of different, different cultural programming and, and entertainment. What did you think you were auditioning for? Um, I actually was asked which department you want to work in. I said, look, um, to me, it doesn't make any difference. Anything you give me, I can I can deliver. So it's like, it's, and they said, look, because you are kind of older than other, at the time I was 46, 47 years old. And they told me because uh, you have that thing, which is nice and settled for doing the news. And I thought, okay, that's fine. You know, so it, that's, that's how I started it. What was your first time on air? I think it was after maybe, if I'm not wrong, maybe after 10 days I start working. 
And then they said, yeah, you got to go live. And I was like, it was nerve wracking. I was telling them, you're so brave. You guys going live. And he said, I've, I've never done this before. But uh, luckily, I never messed it up. So it was quite kind of, you know, it, it was it was it was nerve wracking, I would say, especially when they count in your ear from the gallery, 10, 9, and you think, oh, my God, now 30 million people are watching you. What are millions of people are watching you? At yeah. the same time, any mistake you make, you're going to be like, eh, you made a mistake. So, yeah, there's a famous. Um, uh, did, you, did you ever see the movie Broadcast News? I know I didn't have time oh, to watch it's, it. It's a, it's a fabulous, fabulous movie. But there's a there's a moment where the guy who's been the, the producer all his life, you know, has always wanted to be on the air. And he finally gets on the air and they go live and he's sweating so badly that his shirt and his jacket and everything start show the to show the the sweat uh, the 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 stains of the the sweat. Uh, it, it's a really, I mean, having done a lot of live broadcasting myself, it's a different thing from taping an interview or doing. It's it's a really jacked up kind of energy, especially when you're aware that there's a lot of people watching you and oftentimes judging you for a lot of things that have nothing to do with actually the content of what you're saying. They're looking at your, your hair or the way your body is standing or what clothing you're wearing. Or, um, so it, it can be quite nerve wracking. It is. I mean, uh, we get comments like for, for the tie you wear, pocket square you got in your pocket, your hair, what hair products you use. They, they just talk about everything. And that's so nice. That, that's how much they pay attention to the detail. And also um, anything goes wrong it's on your neck you know what i mean um gallery can go wrong technical issues and people think oh be savvy he cannot do this he doesn't know what he's talking about or auto cue jump out all of a sudden you're thinking it's a one hour news i cannot memorize one hour so i need that auto cue i need the auto prompter but sometimes things happen and then that depends on your skill how you manage to actually handle it but it's it's not an easy job i would say can I, I mean, I hate to descend into superficiality here, but you are known for your fabulous hair. Um, and and can I ask you, I mean, I think I saw you saying somewhere that the, the, the gray hair, the white hair, it happened quite early in life for you. Yes. Yes. Um, I, uh, when I was 16 years old, my father had a car accident and after nine days he passed away. So I was only turned 16. And uh, after about a month, I saw a white hair, middle of my head, then few at the side. I was only like not even 17 years old. So I think emotionally, it really um, affected me. And um, because we had nobody with gray hair in my family. And when I was 20, 21, when I went to do my army, I had like few white at the sides. And then when I was getting married, I had like 30% white hair when I was only 23, 24. And then uh, increased every time. So, but I still, I'm happy that I didn't lost the hair. It's gone gray. No, you haven't lost it at all. But the, I mean, I'm sure somebody's done the analogy with Anderson Cooper with you, right? Because uh, of CNN, because he quite famously in his 30s already had the gray hair and 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 was rocking it. I mean, you you've never nobody ever came to you at the beginning of Manitou or something and said, you know, why don't you color this brown or or change it or something like that. Actually, no, not in Manitou, but we I had so many people directing or leaving comments under the Instagram page. All of us thought, why don't you color your hair? It's way better with the darker hair. And I thought, no, that's not going to look good, you know. So they're always insisting, or some of the family back in Iran, relatives, they said, why don't you color your hair? It will make you like 10 years younger. I said, I don't want to look younger. I'm happy with what I have at the moment. But it would be totally awesome if you just turned up on Manitou all of a sudden, like one day with like jet black hair. That you yeah, exactly. <laughs> to be honest with you, I in my lifetime, I've done it once. Uh, we went for holiday to Iran. That was, I was, I think it was 30 years old. And we went to Kerman to my wife's, one of the uncle's uh, house for a couple of days. And uh, his lovely wife said, okay, Fashion, why don't you color your hair? Let's dye your hair. I said, well, okay then. So we dyed, and it was really nice. I had like nice short hair and it was good. After three days, all the red coming out from the, I said, this is my last time I actually would dye my hair. So that was the last time I've never done it again. Uh, I shave my hair to look like even because you know. It's, it's but you're much. very you're, you're very handsome. It, it, everybody talk, calls you handsome, and 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 you you really, I mean, you've been considered good looking. I would imagine since you were you were probably a popular guy in your teenage years, right? 
Well, that you have to ask my wife. I think that's one of the no, reasons. No, I'm asking you. I'm asking you, and I think you can be honest about it. Okay, I'm going to be moderate. But yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, I was okay. I was all right. And I think she fell in love with my looks. I managed to um, fool her, you know, say, look how good looking I am. You know? uh, but she always had issue with my hairs. What's, what's that? She always had issues. She said, you take too much to fix your hair. Because those days, I used to have mullets, you know, back long. And then we had these, you know. All, uh, oh, you had sideburns? No sideburn. You know, you call them mullets, don't oh, you? Oh, mullet. You had long in the back and... And, and the front was... Do you remember, uh, what was that singer's name? Uh, Paul Young. Yes, of course. Was, so it was the same hairstyle. It was very popular in Iran. So if you have that, then you will be... And it was very hard to manage to do that. You had lots of hair spray and stuff. And obviously, I had to look perfect, so I was always and so she fell in love with my hair as well. Actually, <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, that's why you still, you know, I still you've got the nice gel in there. I mean, you still take care of it. Clearly, you have okay. to keep your wife happy. Um, Fasha, let me ask you about the last. Uh, I guess to get a little more serious about um, w your job and what you've had to do in the last year, it occurs to me as an outsider. I mean, I know some of this by knowing you guys and knowing cave on Abbasi and others. And, and, uh, but, but it, it occurs to me that Manoto had to, as, as a product of events in the, around the world. And, and it wasn't the only network that had to do this, had to pivot somewhat uh, last year after the killing of Masa Amini and the, the, the desperate outrage of Iranians inside Iran and around the world and the global outrage, in fact, and, and the programming shifted. Tell me what that was like and what, how you had had to manage the last year and what must have been a, a kind of a change at Manoto in terms of having to change the tone and deal with some really serious shit going on in Iran. Uh, definitely, because what happened in Iran, it was so serious that whole plan in Manitou changed. One of the beauty with Manitou is, uh, I think anything happens. I mean, COVID happened, different things happen. Uh, very quickly, they managed to shift and direct the company in a way that it will do better than before. I mean, during the COVID, so many other companies, they got bankrupt or the program got affected if there were TV channels and stuff. But Manitou managed to produce more program and maintain the good shop because they said people at home now it's you know lockdown and people need more programs so it was more pressure on people i mean working with Manitou, working from home give them the facility to work from home but they will always come up with an idea that to be updated for that moment and the same thing was for um uh, that happens so whole focus of the company went on to this scenario and when that went down uh, i think so many other companies tried to go back to normal but for manoto we thought this will be uh odd this is normalizing like okay okay people died they got shot they got blind they got tortured they got raped you know nice now it's finished now it's done but with manoto we said no no this is not going to happen so we cannot have for no rules concerts and people come and dance and stuff yeah. We have to remember that because so many family, they lost their loved one. So we had a duty to remember them. It's, I mean, it's so easy because people get fed up. They say, oh, we had enough with this news. You know, we know all about it. So let's stop doing that. But Manitou maintained that for those people who lost their life, their eyesight, their life, everything, and try to remember them and keep the flare on. Do you know what I mean? So I think that was one of the... Good things and what happened with Manitou mainly we switched into the news basically so the entertainment part um kind of gone for now so uh but uh, because that, i was in did, news, that, did that put more uh i don't know pressure or emphasis on you uh well i can't say more pressure because for us we are we are professional okay so it's a job do things happen like this i mean during the uh Hizesh, for the first three weeks, I didn't take no a day off. And I was willing to do that. It wasn't that I was asked, well, they needed people because we had three, four live show every day. So mm. the, four o'clock, three o'clock, five o'clock, nine o'clock. So it, everything was live. It wasn't that repeat. And uh, we were, all of us, not just me, we were all working around the clock. We start at 10 o'clock, finish, got home by 12 o'clock midnight. I didn't see my children and my family for three weeks. I would come home, everybody's sleeping. I wake up, everybody's gone. So... 
uh, but I wouldn't mind. I would rather to do that another six months, but see a positive things happen in Iran, yeah. which will happen eventually. Well, I was going to ask you about that. I mean, one of the things we've talked about a lot on this show, and you may know that, is 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 the uprising. And there was a moment, I would say, somewhere in October and November of last year, I guess about a year ago now, um, where there was a real sense of, and, and perhaps it was misled, perhaps it was premature, perhaps it was naive, but you felt a real sense across the uh, Iranian global population uh, of not just unity for a, 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 a beautiful and may, maybe fleeting moment, but also uh, an expectation that change was really coming and, and maybe coming soon. Did did you feel that at that time too, or or was the fact that you're kind of at the center of things, knowing what's going on in Iran more so, and what was happening on the ground, did it did you stay sort of more realistic, if you will, about things? I think once, I mean, what happened in Iran here, the people the way united. I mean, in UK, other countries, it, it was fantastic to begin with, but after a while, what happened? You see like different opinion, people wanted to do their own things and they want to get what they want to. And that's actually, uh, to me, it was, um, I was heartbroken to see that, that there's too many different positions coming and they just, they're not thinking about people in Iran. Because to me, most important is what people are saying in the street of Iran. So what they want to do, because who am I or anybody like me to make decision for them and say, no, we have to do this. No, we have to do that. No, you don't do nothing. You've been here 45 years as an opposition or whatever, or TV channel, whatever you're doing. And you haven't done bugger all. You didn't do anything. Now it comes, people came to the street. Now you're making for them, uh, telling them what to do. Mm. So that actually... It ruined everything, I think, because there were so many um, disagreements between the people and groups, which I was actually witnessing in London Street here myself, because I, the day was all the demonstration happening in London. It was Saturday, which I work. And a couple of days I had off on Saturday, which it was a big demonstration happened. I went with my daughter and uh, we were like, it was heavy rain coming. It was lots of Iranian, but we joined in and uh, I thought we have to be part of it. And I've, I've, been, I've been there several times. It was fantastic. And the vibe was so good. But um, eventually, it's, um, it changed, to be honest. So, When you talk about dictating what, what, what the future is going to be, et cetera, are you talking about the Manchur? Is that the part where you really think things fell apart? Uh, to be honest with you, no. I don't, I don't think there was anything wrong with the Manchur. I think um, what happened in what... In that Manchur, I mean, when people sat next to each other and people knew who were they, they're going to deal with, and some people didn't want to play the part. I don't want to go too much into the detail. Sure. I'm not a politician, but uh, I, I don't think that was the reason. I think it was just people planning things in their heads for future, which is not what people thinking in Iran. I think that was the reason. And that's what I think if something needs to happen, it has to happen in Iran, not in here. And uh, we can just be the voice if we can. Otherwise, no, I'd rather not to comment on that at all, to be honest. You're you're in such an interesting position when you're, um, I would say this if you were working at Iran International too, I want those two channels in particular, where you're, you're broadcasting, you're in London, but your audience is inside Iran. And despite the fact that you're not inside Iran, you have to, show you you have to win their trust and and earn their their connection you know um you have to keep in touch with what's happening in iran um in a very profound way you're the face for them right and one of the things that manato uh, has become famous for uh certainly over the last year with the uprising was was playing clips of of citizen journalism or, or people were sending videos that you guys would then play on Manoto. And I didn't know that. I mean, I knew you did this I reporter thing, but I didn't know that you're 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 actually one of the people who collects these videos and has to go through them. And it would give you a tremendous insight into what I mean, you've probably seen things that you can't show us, you know, that you wouldn't put on the air, et cetera. 
Tell me what you learned about the Iranian people in 2022, 2023, through these videos that have been sent and that you that you um, uh, curate and put on iReporter. What su- uh, I can't say surprised me because um, Iranian always very smart, <clears throat> but what happened in Iran it showed that people are so united in Iran. That's what something people thought it would be issue, and also they can see everything and they can analyze everything. And the way they send the report to us, I mean, when sometimes I see, I get like, wow, they pointing at things that I never thought about it. Uh, any any subject you will think <clears throat> will get reports from Iran's street every day. So I have that sort of a connection, which is uh, like day to day, I'm in touch with them. They send the reports. I have to watch them all, choose some. And the most difficult part in that segment is that to which one to choose, because there's so many good clip comes and you're thinking if you don't show them, so it's going to get wasted. And that person risked his life. He could go to prison maybe for sending me that video, but he he's done it. You know, he sent it to us. And I always have an argument with the producer of the news. And I tell them, look, I've got like only 13 minutes. I report. They say, no, no, no. The arm, I report it shouldn't be more than seven minutes. So I always try to squeeze as much reports because we have to do everything from scratch. I have to go through all of them. I have to choose them. I have to fact check them to make sure it's correct and also edit them, shorten them as much as possible without changing the, any concept or anything on it. How do you but, decide? How do you decide what you're going to run? Okay, every day we have a subject of the news, what's happening. So anything related to the daily news, we will usually choose. So it will it will support. And don't forget, it's not only we showing our report, the Gozarishkar, is we use it for the VTs in the news, the reports. So it gets used all different parts of yeah. uh, news. Nowadays, because we are doing more news, not entertainment, even the other department like Manoto Plus and then Manoto Live, they do between the shows. So we have so many live shows happening, which we never had it before. So this change happens. So they show this eye reporter as well. So it's getting played on different departments in Salomon's program, in different programs. So it's get air. So people's voice can be here more than before. So it's like, and it's, it, it touch your hearts. You know, you think, oh my God, people actually in Iran trust us so much. So we have a duty to be their voice. Well, it's a, it's a tremendous responsibility because depending on, I mean, some of these videos can and have changed the narrative on that particular day or for a week or for, or for more. And I've got to imagine that you receive, like I intimated before, you, you probably receive all kinds of different stuff and including things that you're not sure if you should air that um, you know would have a tremendous impact if you did, right? That's right. Yeah, yeah. It's so so many times you get reports that uh, they're very graphic. You cannot show or the things they say. They they're very um, rock, as you know. So they they will just tell their opinion, which so it's it's not possible to air that. So they have to put beep on it. You know, it's just like you have to play around with it. But it's it's amazing the amount of the reports we get from Iran. It's unbelievable, and that shows that people need some places that they can trust that they're going to, you know, echo their voice so everybody can hear them. It's also uh, um, back to the emotional nature of what you have to do. Uh, that's a freaking tough gig there, buddy. Like you, 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 you have to sit and sift through uh, and you can't take the day off and say, no, I'm not going to look at these videos today. Sift through this stuff that's coming at you that has got to be not just powerful and in some cases inspirational, but on the opposite hand, devastating, disgusting, deflating. Um, do you, uh, how 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 do you cope with that? Uh, it happens many times. Once I'm editing and watching these videos, I burst into tears. Nobody realizes because I'm just working and just crying. The other night, uh, sometimes you get emotional, not because it's it's you get it's a feeling of maybe happiness that that your people get everything so perfectly, so right. And the, the way they're changing, everything is shifting for people. I mean, um, for instance, uh, last year when it was Tasu Ashura, this old Azadari they do for Muharram, uh, 
it was the first year that we received so many videos that people are saying they really believe Islam. So they're very into it, but they don't believe the government. So they're saying, if we're going and doing this as a Dari, mourning is not because we love the government. We're doing this because we're Muslim. So it, they completely shifted. So I was I was doing editing this video the whole day, and some of them I just stopped crying. It was just, it was like I couldn't believe that people are that what voice and understand every aspect of what they're doing. And then one of the colleagues saw me. Uh, I'm sure you've seen Omidayem, and then they said, "No, we saw you that you were really uh, touched by video." Say, yeah, "So come tonight to the Omidayem. We want to take you there." So I went to that program, and people were calling in. And it was the same scenario. They were saying, look, we are one of the people, I mean, some of them, they called and they said, we organized this as other is. And uh, this year, we're not doing it because of the Khizash Mahsa Amini and the people being killed. So we don't believe that. But so it was, it was, a, it had a big impact. Do you know what I mean? So it's these things you see and it really uh, touches your heart. You know, it's, it's very um, emotional. I can, yeah. I mean, that that is a very, very tough gig that you have when you do that. Um, it is such a, it, it's just actually a real, real honor to get to talk to you. I've been looking forward to it before I let you go. You know, I, I wasn't sure if I was going to ask anything about your dad. I know you lost him when you were, you were very young and, and you talked about, um, um, the, the hair going white. I mean, that's a, that's gotta be a, a, a suggestion of the anxiety or the difficulties you went through after losing your dad as a teenager. Um, what 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 can you say about him and what would he think of how far Farshad Mutaqi has come today? Uh, I think he, he would have been proud of me. Uh, um, and he was very much like myself, I would say. He was like very talkative, very kind to people and trying to be like, you know, uh, he was a people's person as well. And I think maybe seeing me right now, that's to see amount of, attention we're getting from people and the trust not only attention is just like how much people trust you i think that's something i wish for my children to be the same do you know what i mean to to be able to i'm not saying i'm making a change changes but that as long as people trust you and you have that respect and that reputation that i think that's a lot because gaining such a um trust amongst people that is not easy you know, there's people that you look at and you go, that person was meant to do that. I know, I know in a previous conversation, you told me that everybody's always told you, you have the goods to be a news anchor. You've got the charm, you've got the voice, you, you're a smart guy, you're a handsome guy. Do you, do you, and now you are a news anchor. That's what you do. Do, do you, do you feel like you're to a certain extent, you're doing what you were always meant to do? I think so. I think so. I think, um, my wife was asking me actually about a couple of weeks ago, he said, uh, if you would say what's the best time of your life, which part we say, I said, when I saw you and we were like friends before, and that was honest, true answer. I said, and then he said, what else? I said, right now, I said, what I'm standing right now, it's something I would never think of that one day I will be in such a position. And uh, to be able to do something, I see this not as a job, uh, Jianjian. I see this as an opportunity to take a step for my people. I'm not doing anything special, but you know what I mean? So if, if people trust me and uh, see me as somebody who is, you know, for them, it's, it's hard to say. I went to Turkey a couple of weeks ago, a couple of months ago for a holiday, summer holiday with my wife and family. And uh, I come across with so many Iranian in that hotel we were. And to me, that holiday become the most amazing holiday. The feedback I had from these people, every day I wanted to sit down and cry because they come, I saw more than hundred families in that time. And every single one of them came to me. They know me by name, by my family name, and they start hugging me, taking picture. And I was, uh, because I never, I didn't know how much fan we have. I mean, people, how much know us. and. To me, and they saw that, I saw them that how much they trust me, how much they respect me. And to me, that was like an eye opener, to be honest with you. Because the family tells you in Iran that hey, people know you, they recognize you. And so, yeah, okay, so what? But it was a different feeling that to have that, that moment to be with them. They came yesterday from Iran. They see you, they get surprised. Some of them, they come and cry. Some of them hug you. Some of them take picture. Some of them wants to know what's happening. 
to me it was it was amazing it was an amazing trip to just seeing my you know fellow iranian coming from iran i'm really glad you told that uh, that story and i'm glad that you're getting that feedback i i'm grateful uh, uh you've we've i've kept you too long i know it's late in london and i i really appreciate the time you've given us and um i i look forward to to chatting with you more thank you so much for doing this today thank you so much for the time you give me and it was a pleasure to be in your program merci khodafis khodafis shabab